cool. All right. So this is a call convened by Ken Homer around Frederick Lalu's The Week. And off to you. Well, thank you all for joining us. We're still waiting for Mila and um, one other person, or is it my, somebody else? Um, I, don't I know. show uh, Stuart Levine. Stuart Levine, right, Stuart. I hope Stuart didn't go to his own um, Zoom. His own Zoom. Yeah. So... With good eyes, Wendy. Thank you for catching that. I would yeah. never have, have figured that one out. Um, sure. Well, I, me... I, I was trying to be proactive and put the right Zoom in my calendar. And then when I went in there, I'm like, there's already a Zoom in there and those Zooms do not match. <laughs> That's how I, otherwise it never would have, never would have caught it either. I'm just going to take a half a second here and That's forward the Zoom link on to Stuart. So I'm, I'm sending an email right now. Oh, okay, great, great. Um, and Jerry, okay. your sound is very echoey. So I don't know if maybe it's pulling from your, I'm in a room. I can hear you fine. I just wanted yeah. to let you know in case that was unintentional. It's, uh, it's, it's, well, I'm trying to use a better microphone so that it actually sort of feels some of that. I think partly if I talk softer, it doesn't bounce so much in the room, but I appreciate that. It almost sounds like the microphone is not on. Oh, interesting. So let's go back to- Like it's that kind of echoey. It sounds like it's coming through your computer. Back to Zoom. Zoom thinks it's on this microphone as my microphone. Okay. And hold on, let me actually switch back to, um, this microphone and you can tell me which is better because that's important. External mic, let's see. This should be a switch. I should have just switched over to this microphone here. That yeah. actually sounds better. That's yeah. better. Lovely. <laughs> Yesterday I had the problem where I was wearing a zippered sweater and the microphone he was rubbing against the zipper, but no, no zipper. So I put away the better mic. Well, I had to buy a, um, we had a retaining wall rebuilt behind our house. It was literally Four feet behind the wall I was sitting next to for all the calls I did with um, with Matt on the Global Financial Services Company. So I bought this this headset, which does not have noise canceling headphones, but a noise canceling mic. And I'm asking people, can you hear what's going on? They're like, no, we just hear your voice. And there was a jackhammer, like literally wow. right behind me. It's amazing. So um, I have to say the noise canceling mic works really well. Well. Welcome. I would love to get the name of that one that you're using. I, yeah. I, yeah, sure. It's called the Jabra, G-A-B-R-A. And I'll have to dig it out. Yeah, J -A -B I'll have to dig it out because they did something really stupid where uh, there's there's a, um, I can't remember it now because I bought it so long ago. There's the Jabra Evolve 2, number 2, number 30, and the Jabra Evolve 30, number 2. And they're two really different headsets. And one of them is as cheap as can be. And as soon as the cord rubs on your shirt, you hear it in your earpiece. And you know, it's it's so it's the Jabra Evolve 2 number 30. Number two space number 30. It's about, I think it was like 80 bucks or 90 bucks on on uh, Amazon. And it's been a great headset. I really like it. So well, let's let's dive in. Uh, hope people show up. Thank you all for coming. It's lovely to see you. Um, I don't think everybody knows everybody, so maybe we'll just start with some introductions. Um, my name is Ken Homer. Um, I saw this thing from Frederick Alou and uh, Helene and on the week, and I thought, oh, there's Stuart. Uh, I thought this would be a great thing for some people on OGM to dive into. It's really looking at what's going on in the world, the level of challenge we're facing, the the ecological devastation, climate change, you know, the whole the whole Megillah. Um, stuff I've been following for about 30 years, and um, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to explore this with other folks because I think we really are going to need each other as we navigate these next few decades. And um, uh, I just was so delighted that you all said you'd like to play along. So welcome. And um, uh, who would like to introduce themselves next? I'm Jerry. I'm probably the most known, but most of us have hung out in different places um, together, but uh, um, so I think I'll just uh, pass the mic to Todd. Thanks, Jerry. I'm Todd Hoskins, not uh, in the pretty mountains behind me, but in uh, Southwest Michigan, right down there. 
and it's so handy to live in a handshape state. I mean, it is. <laughs> it's it's habit now. I mean, we live where I live here. But <laughs> actually, it's, it's actually over here. Um, I'm a big fan of Jerry Mikowski, but um, I'm also a fan of Fred Lelou and reinventing organizations. It ignited a number of things in my life when I read that. Uh, so I'm drawn to anything he's involved in, but also uh, the premise of this being an experience is what shifts people's behavior um, is dear to me. So I'm curious, as, well, how are they going to do that then? So that's what brings me here. Excellent. And I will pass to Stacy. Um, I'm Stacy. I'm in New York. The last part of what you said is what I was really interested in, how the experience can really change things. And I'm a fan of everybody here. <laughs> Past Wendy. Thanks, Stacey. Hi, I'm Wendy McLean. I'm also in New York, about an hour and a bit from Stacey, um, which is lovely. Um, let's see what brings me here. Um, Climate change has always been a, a, a topic of interest of mine. I've spent some time in the past on projects and working with people towards, you know, some initiatives that help along the way. But it's always been, for me, one of those background issues that I try and put a little time and energy into when I can. It is very nice to play in the space of people who are willing to dive into the discomfort because there are many people who don't want to go there as they so aptly talked about, I think, in the first video. So I'm interested in that piece too, like what kind of conversation, how does conversation emerge from and within, you know, people who are willing to go into those spaces together and then um, can't wait to see kind of where we come out the other side. Stuart, that leaves you. Yeah, uh, I'm Stuart. I, I, I'm from New York <laughs> originally. I was born in Brooklyn um, <laughs> and I love New York. Uh, I read Al Gore's first book, um, you know, before the, in, An Inconvenient Truth. And the um, balance. Yeah, and just, you know, kind of grabbed onto it. Um, I was one of the Al Gore's volunteers you know, went to went to Nashville. Was trained by him to um, to go do the climate science presentation when convincing people that this was real was was still a, a factor. And I I you know I had I had the presentation on my laptop for a couple of years. Um, I can't say I've been an activist, uh, but I but it's with me. In other words, watching the film last night, um, I didn't learn anything new. Right? And, and it, it, it's interesting because I also listened to the first um, two sessions of a, of a six week re retreat with Pema Chodron. Um, it's about the Bardo space uh, and we are in the Bardo space. Does everybody know what a Bardo is? I know. Maybe not for, so Bardo is a Tibetan concept of um, uh, where you are between lifetimes. So when you, they have a, depends on a practice called POA where um, they practice being aware of the moment of death and the bell will ring and you go out through your head and you are you are now out of this life and in the next one. And uh, so in a bardo, things are coming into and out of existence very, very quickly. And the purpose of uh, training is to stabilize your attention. So when you're in this place of turmoil and chaos, you can actually focus. If you don't the Tibetans say you will fall headlong into a womb because you will see people fornicating. You're like, that looks really interesting. And next thing you know, you're inside of a womb. So you want to be really choiceful about where you put your attention. And they say, look for the light. So go towards the light. Um, I like the idea of a place where things are coming into and out of existence very rapidly because that seems to be the bardo descending uh, onto planet Earth where things are rapidly changing in many ways that, that they've been stable for a very long time. So it seems really apt. Okay, um, looks like Mila's not going to make it. Uh, I did email her, let her know. I sent her the link, uh, reminded her, but she's not here. So um, let's pick up on, on what Stuart said of, of not learning. For how many people, um, anybody would like to share something that they did learn or, or how they were affected by watching this presentation? First of all, did you all have a chance to watch it? Yes? Okay, great. And, and I, I like Stuart, I, I guess I'll just jump in. 
I didn't learn a lot that was new either. This is something I became aware of back in 1988 when I started to read Joanna Macy's work, Despair and Personal Empowerment, The Nuclear Age. Um, and uh, so there wasn't a lot new in there for me, but what I did see was it was gratifying because this is stuff I've talked about for over 30 years to vary with varying degrees of success to see that it's actually starting to catch on now. It's pe more and more people are starting to wake up to this. And, the, and um, I'm curious, I already had a, a person in mind for 2050. I have chosen not to have children, but I have some friends who have a three-year-old that I just visited last fall. And oh my God, this little girl just totally stole my heart. And I was thinking, wow, you know, she's born in um, 2019, she's gonna be 31 in 2050 and what's the world gonna be like for her? And it really brings a personal aspect of what we're facing is going to be things that I'll probably be gone. I'll be 93 in 2050 if I make it that long, you know? Um, but this beautiful child is gonna be facing some stuff that we really can't predict. And so it just, it really brought it home for me of, of you know, having a, a, th a thread to that future. and. So that both makes me sad that they're going to have to figure this out and hopeful because I really do see that there's a tremendous um, willingness on the part of younger generations, I think, to really engage. They're aware in ways that, that the baby boomers are not. I think there's not so much denial in the younger generations, um, the millennials and, and Gen Z. Of, uh, we have to face this. We've, we've got to do something. So that was what got stirred up for me in watching it. I had two different reactions. Um, one was the young woman who was with Frederick Lalu was physically, um, the content was really affecting her physically and she was struggling a lot with just presenting to us the, the, the ideas. And she's clearly from an extremely young age devoted herself to trying to solve big problems in the world and putting her life on the line. And she was really like, I. I was affected by how much she was struggling. Uh, Frederick got a little emotional toward the end thinking about his kids, showing us a picture of his kids, but, but I was very struck by, by that. Then, and I, maybe it's the second episode, maybe it's the third episode. <clears throat> to me, so much of this is really not about all the global crises, but about how we see each other and about the political crisis and about trust. And, and the reason I give a crap about trust is that I think that if we figure out how to trust each other again, which I think we figured out in a lot of early cultures, but we've destroyed very effectively, we can then tackle all these things. And, and in fact, we would start building things that don't destroy the planet in the first place, because the problem is that we allowed a whole series of mechanisms to just rape and pillage the earth. We, we've, 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 a lot, we've, we've grown up and taken for granted a system that isn't working. And so, and so I was a little disappointed that it was a recitation of climate crises that I'm familiar with also, not as well as you all, but, but I've been tracking this stuff and I got all the crises in my brain. And I was like, check, 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 check. Oh, forgot about the glaciers melting. And I got, I got, a, got a litany of crises and they're horrible. They're, they're like, and any, any two of them are enough to not sleep for a couple nights. Um, <clears throat> but, but we're in a, in a Mexican standoff because other people very intentionally, extremely intentionally don't want us to solve these problems for a variety of reasons, mostly self-interest. And so, so, so to me in this whole puzzle, that's the interesting nut. And, and if this week process goes by and they don't dive into that hard, I will actually be really disappointed. Gary, could you say a little bit more about the people who, um, in who you perceive intentionally don't want to um, solve this crisis? I'm, I'm curious to, you know, who they, who, who, who pops up? Sure. Um, well, um, <clears throat> basically, um, uh, anybody mind if I share my brain? Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. It's all, it's all kind of in there, right? What would a call a jury be if we didn't have your brain at some point? <laughs> you know, and, I, and I just put earth in the balance in the in my brain because I didn't have it there. And I started a thought for this call. Uh, so so um, I have a thought called we are in a titanic battle over the narratives in our heads. And we always have been. 
<clears throat> that that basically this is this is my version of the story of human history is that for long periods of time some narrative dominates and, and my, my art history teacher back at undergrad said hey for 2000 years egyptians do this and then he says it's not because they can't draw perspective perspective isn't something that gets invented later it's because religion says this is what art is and this is what we preserve and this is what we do and and at every 20 year segment in the middle of 2000 years of, of this there are knifings and beheadings and there's all sorts of regular human drama but this is what art looks like in our in our record for that long period of time and i was like holy crap that was a system of scripts and heads that that was incredibly durable right and so this is kind of informed by another thought which is that we are currently in a non-linear war which was informed by the documentary hypernormalization by adam curtis which i watched back in probably 2017 is when i caught it and Adam Curtis convinced me in this documentary that there is a, a full non-shooting war going on already with misinformation, disinformation, spin, lies, all that kind of stuff. And by doing this, you can win, win power and it's extremely effective. This really works. And these people are busy pitting us against ourselves. They're busy sort of dividing us. You know, the way the British Raj conquers you know, India is they, they make friends with the Sikhs. They say, you're our soldiers. And they, and then a couple other tribes and they use Indians against Indians to, 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 to master an entire subcontinent. So this has happened over and over and over again. And we are currently in the middle of a terrible one of these and the people, and, and there's lots of forces that want to preserve the old status quo, whether it's the petroleum industrial, com, com, whatever, military industrial complex, uh, politicians who just want to stay in power, uh, aspiring autocrats and dictators like Orban and Putin. I mean, all those people want to topple our human attempts to sort of stabilize things and make things better for everybody. And to me, that's a giant thing that's right in front of, behind, around, beside all the other crap because man-made climate change, the Anthropocene era we keep talking about, is it, happening because of everything I just said, plus we, we reified and sanctified capitalism, colonialism, imperialism, all the things that run before that, which we're now trying to hit like the undo key on, on the global keyboard, and it's not working. Like Black Lives Matter is a good attempt, but if you're a black person in America, before Black Lives Matter became a thing, but if you're a black person in America, was your life better at the end of the first black president's eight years in, on duty? No. And so, so, so that's why. Uh, thanks for asking, Stuart. Sorry for the long answer, but but for me, these things are wildly, deeply intertwined, and so much of this is about power and politics, and not about the physics of, oh my gosh, you know, we can't reflect enough sunlight. No, I, I think it was. I, I appreciate. I appreciate um, the, the the articulation, Jerry. And in, in some ways, not to, not to kind of jump to beg the question, but <laughs> at some essential place, the question is, how can, how can we get beyond that phenomenon? And it, it, well, it's probably not gonna matter for us, but it will matter for, for the, you know, the little three-year-old that Ken was talking about, and it'll matter for, you know, my, Two step grandchildren. So, um, just my reactions to the video. Um, I think similar to everyone else. Um, I, I'm not sure any one thing was glaringly um, new to me. However, some details were new. I appreciated them showing the the uh, data around wildlife loss um, ecosystem loss to date uh, that those data points, I was not familiar with before. Right. Um, so it just interesting. No, I had a general understanding that it was happening, but did not understand how much had already happened. Things like that. I think, uh, for me, um, aptly create an urgency that, uh, yeah, an urgency, I think is what the feeling was. And um, so there was that for me also definitely felt a frustration, like 
wanted to get through this piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know generally this stuff, like I'm already want to do something. I think one of the things I've been struggling with, um, is having done some early local work, um, um, years ago, I, it, it, I was left with a feeling of, we need to do something bigger, <laughs> faster. And I, as an individual person have absolutely no understanding of how to do that and, um, or how to contribute to that. And so I was that all those feelings were coming up again for me. Um, and, um, and, and a gratitude for this conversation that was coming up, a gratitude for communities like OGM and other ones that are trying to work on this problem and just having an awareness that there are good people trying to work on this in very dynamic and powerful ways is like a, a little bit of soothing, <laughs> soothing balm to the soul. And so kind of all of that was spinning and I'm, e I'm, I'm so eager to just get to the end already. Like if anyone else have a solution out there, please wave a flag because I am, you know, how are we going to bring all this together? Cause it's obvious to, to Jerry's point. And I think I was posting, you know, the movie don't look up highlighted it again for me, just how the systems in a myriad of ways are not serving us. And this is yet, this is one of the bigger ones in my opinion, but there's health is one agriculture is one, like, you know, just all these things are so interconnected and I'm so eager to get through some of it and enable more change. And so, yeah. Well, it's a lot to respond to. Thank you, everyone. Um, I want to respond to each one of you and the movie, and I'm just not going to even try to do that. I'm, I'm just going to see what comes up here. The uh, yeah, there was there was not new information, but I think one of the points, reflection points for me is I I really appreciated how they were inviting the emotion, the emotional impact. Um, they were pausing, they were acknowledging what they were saying was hard, and they were doing all of that. And in experiencing, witnessing that, it made me realize that I've been in a grieving process for a while and I've been angry for a while and I'm not a Jem Bendel a deep adaptation person who believes that, you know, we need to go all the way down and this, this, this is hopeless. I do not believe this is hopeless whatsoever but to use both the data and our imagination to sense what the loss of relationship to our planet means. And that's where I think the disappointment for me comes is, um, and it's okay, I'm, I'm wacky, I'm not like most people, but I'm, um, to me, we've lost touch with life and who we are as an animal, as a species, uh, that we are a part of all of this, and we we are seeking solutions like the machines we've trained been trained to be, instead of living life as a species in which we are in connection with our environment, and the solutions will come in mass if we are connected to life. So at some point, I hope to hear something and. People use different language. You could say connection, you could use awareness, you could use consciousness. I went and grabbed my Gus Beth quote because you know, he was Obama's advisor on climate change and Jerry's smiling, he's probably seen this before. Um, and I read this years ago and thinking some people get it and that will, um, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And to me, that brings more hope than a technical set of technical solutions because it's too complex to actually grasp the technical solutions. To me, it's a spiritual issue and spirituality is far beyond my understanding. I can't grasp it and I believe in magic. Thank you. So I'm having the same experience now that I had watching the film and that was that I kept checking to make sure I wasn't um, following, you know, they had their list of the defense mechanisms and I wanted it, I, I knew I wasn't checking my phone and any of that, but I wanted to know if I was caught up in magical, magical thinking 
or I'm okay. But the truth is that I'm tuned into that same feeling that it's going to take the spiritual awakening. And that's sort of where I try to live. And so I, I think it was really good that even though um, people are aware of different things, I think having it all in one place is really powerful. Um, and it is really scary. And maybe some people need to be scared because we don't tend to take action unless we are in some way. Um, but I also think it's really important to not lose hope. So personally, that's where I try to sit. So, but I, I'm recognizing it's, you know, I'm kind of fooling myself. Like I'm not doing as good as I think I am. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that I think is one of, um, one of the great challenges that we're not feeling it day to day, moment to moment. You know, our lives are in, in, in some ways unchanged. I mean, you know, for the last year or so, I, I, I look at people out and about and I, I shake my head sometimes and I say, aren't you aware? <laughs> mm -hmm. don't, you, don't you know what's, what's, really, what's really going on? Um, um, and, and it's interesting when you talk about, you know, Jerry, when you talk about what's grabbed our brains. Um, so, so one of my reactions was I live on the water. I live right on the, on the, on the San Francisco Bay in Alameda. And so one of my reactions when I watched the movie, it reactivated the thinking, well, I've got to sell my home because the water <laughs> is rising and there's a lot of money involved in this and I've got to escape to higher ground. And it's a home that I love. It's a sanctuary. It's a bird sanctuary. It's tidal. It's unbelievable what goes on out here. Um, and yet, because of the capitalist uh, 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 wiring, uh, there's that piece of knee-jerk reaction. Um, I, I don't know where to go with that. Just, I, just, I just don't. It's an incredible... Um, kind of a kind of a push pull. Thanks, Stuart. I, I really resonate with that. I often feel very schizophrenic. Um, you know, on the one hand, I'm way too aware of multiple ecological and climatological threats that are that are going on. On the other hand, as Paul Hawkins says, you know, if, if you're looking at the data and you're not in despair, you're not really absorbing the data, but if you're looking at who's working on it and you don't have hope, you're not really attuned either. So these two poles of, you know, I know so many people and organizations are working at every level possible to bring about a, a greater awakening. And to Todd's point, I use spiritual intelligence as a metaphor for whatever makes you feel connected to something larger than yourself. So um, if for some people, that's nature. Some people, it's family. Some people, it's work. Some people, it's religion. You know, but we are all um, earthlings. You know, Alan Watts says the earth peoples in the same way that an orange tree oranges or an apple tree apples. And I'm reading Tamsin Willie Barker's book Teeming right now about super organisms and and how uh, they they uh, compound infinite wealth on a finite planet and. I don't like the term biomimicry. I think if we were attuned, if we had our wits about us and we were naturally expressing the, the intelligence of nature through us, we wouldn't have to make up terms like biomimicry. We would be much more aligned and, and operating in ways that uh, we're actually compounding wealth instead of burning it up. Um, so I keep going back to 30 years ago working with Joanna Macy and there are certain rituals that were, were really necessary. And I've come to appreciate deeply the, the role of ritual in transformation. I don't think psychology actually has a clue about what's really needed to bring about the, the deep levels of transformation. Um, so one of those uh, exercises that we did was meeting your death. Um, so this is, we're up in, in Shinoa, up in, in the Redwoods, and it's an old Boy Scout camp. There's a big, huge soccer field. And 
you're told, okay, look around, it's 150 people, look around, make eye contact with somebody, go and stand next to them. And you're like, oh, you look cute, I'll go stand next to you. And they're told, that person is your death. So what we're going to do now in this next bit of time is you're going to walk around in a random walk on the, on the soccer field here and do what you can to avoid making eye contact, except don't just immediately, you know, as soon as that person catches your eye, you know that's that you have to go and meet them. And so when that happens, you go and sit and then you talk about what is it like to meet your death? And it actually proved to be a very um, empowering and lovely uh, ritual where it's like, you know, sooner or later, death is going to catch up and I have a chance to sit and talk with death and, and uh, death. And I'm someone, I'm representing someone else's death. And it, it unfolded the, into a new dimension of, of acceptance, of dropping fear out of the equation of death. Like in my case, death was a very attractive young woman and it worked really great for me to, to talk with her, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, so I think we have to kind of find the rituals that allow us to face these overwhelmingly dark and, and uh, oppressive scenarios that are on people's minds, you know, the runaway tipping points, the climate change, the hothouse scenarios, these are terrifying. Um, but if we don't find a way to actually look at them and, and allow us, as we say, sustain the gaze on this, you know, uh, the Buddhists will go into, into burial grounds and watch bodies decompose and decay and puff up and burst and stink and everything because they know that's going to happen to you. There's, you are forced to confront that. We have to confront this in a way where we have the support that allows us to say, even with all that, I won't let that deter me from what is important. I will continue to work um, to, to bring forth whatever light I can to um, support people who are going through hard times, to find ways to think together uh, and change our thinking from uh, technical to adaptive. We don't have the right mindsets to handle this. We have to move out of mm -hmm. the technical challenges into how do we change en masse large portions of the population's level of engagement with this from being in denial uh, or despair to actively embracing, okay, this is real. What are we going to do? It may not affect me so much, but my kids and my grandkids are going to be, you know, bearing the brunt of this. So, so how are we going to go about that? So um, a, a metaphor is coming up <laughs> and that is, <clears throat> you know, some force uh, 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 <laughs> descending on planet earth with a megaphone saying the earth is dying, <laughs> wake up, the earth is dying. And, it, and in some ways, I mean, I had this flash within the last couple of days, it is. You know, you, you might look at however many, and I don't really know the science that well or the geology um, or the anthropology, but, but there's been a flowering of civilization in some ways, in some ways during our lifetime, you know, the quadratic expansion of technological advancement, um, the, you know, the presence of, of technology and computers. And it's just like, it's almost like it's, Oh my God! This is just unbelievable. These beautiful flowers are are have erupted, and <laughs> that's the end. Okay, that's the end as we know it, or as we've known it. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be something after, but that thing after is different. It's almost like you know part of the and this is interesting because Pema was talking about this last night. You know. Part of the dying process is also a, a rebirthing of some kind. Something else um, is, is, is emerging. I think it was last year I read this book called Collapse about, you know, it was almost like a pioneering book in some sense about what we'll need as humans to survive this, um, uh, this trajectory we're on. Um, yeah, so, so, so there's a lot of people out there preparing for life after collapse, whatever collapse might look like. You know, I, I think we all live in a little bit of hope. I know that I do, that it won't be, you know, a dystopian universe, but it, it may very well be. I had that, I was filled with that fear um, at the beginning of, of, you know, of the pandemic and the isolation, but um, we don't know, I don't know.
meant a lot. Stuart saying that the birth and death connection. Sometimes it strikes me. Sometimes I'm in a. I can't believe this is really happening. With the state of the world. And sometimes it just strikes me as so anthropocentric that life continues and life would continue without us, without us humans. And I don't think life would be better off without us. I don't think that that's the case, um, but we're losing species, but there's all sorts of evolution happening uh, at the same time. And I don't think that for me, it doesn't, that doesn't take away our responsibility um, with the size of our brains that we've been given and the largest population of mammals on the planet um, that we do have stewardship. And so let's not just let things die so that other things can be born. Um, but if I take my We've got to save the humans. When he's, when he said, let's save the planet, sometimes it kind of is interpreted as we need to save the humans. And it's, it's almost, as I'm almost laughing when I hear it because I'm, I'm thinking life will be fine. It's the humans I'm worried about. Yeah, Todd, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because I was thinking about that. My, when I was maybe a young teenager, it was my father who actually said that to me. He said he, he was very in touch with climate change science at that time. And, um, and I remember us having a short conversation and him saying something like, oh, it's not about saving the planet. The planet's going to continue to be around for a really long time. <laughs> it's about saving the ecosystem so humans can survive in it. And I, it, it stuck with me. And I think in some ways, the publicity around that has allowed us to um, distance ourselves from what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit of a shift in narrative to say, uh, to go from let's save the planet to let's save humanity, right? It's, <laughs> so we don't, there's a resistance I'm sure, but I think we'd get a lot further if we started saying, let's save humanity or save the ecology for humanity or something like that, you know, along those lines. Um, planet earth is fine. <laughs> Somebody in the scientific community uh, within NASA said that uh, they believe that they will find life on Mars in the next two years. Uh, evidence of life on Mars. And I stopped to, to take that in and realizing that rock is mostly dead matter. I mean, Almost everything we see was alive at some point. And of course there's life elsewhere, but what does it, what does it do to our conception of ourselves and our planet if there is known life outside of our planet? And I hope it doesn't drive that escapism as to like, where can we find that can, we can go that will, we, can, we need a second chance. And I'm like, I don't think that's gonna go any better until we address, um, you know, our state of connection to each other and to life. Reminds me of a bumper sticker I've seen from the right that says, Earth first, we can log the other planets later. <laughs> oh, <let's see. laughs> um, there is, there does seem to be in human consciousness, this countervailing trend to our, our ecological or evolutionary development of, of becoming more complex and more compassionate. And, and if you look at the history of, of the idea of God, we've moved from very vengeful gods to more compassionate gods. And I think there's a really wonderful, well, in some cases, you know, I don't, I don't really like to talk about God very much because I don't actually find it useful, but the best definition I've ever heard of God comes from a Nakam creditor who says, God is the collective potential of human imagination. That's an idea about God I can actually get behind. Because um, we put our collective potential together of human imagination, we do, have, we do stand a chance. And it shows up again and again in myth and story of, you know, there, are, there are, are those among us or those among us who 
get infected with the bug um, of let's destroy, let's let's tear things down. And you know, I'm certainly aware of how that's shown up my own life. Um, and it's a really naughty problem. How how do we go about addressing that when our very survival as a species might be dependent upon our recognizing that if we continue to sow those seeds, we're gonna we're gonna take ourselves out of the picture. So what does that mean for us as a species of how do we approach this with the appropriate reverence and tools and find the way the way through to uh, to you know transcend and include that? I don't know. It's a it's a total mystery to me. But yeah. as you speak, Ken, um, you know, what pops up in my mind is that um, we're all addicted. We've, we've all become addicts to, you know, think about all the little nuances of your own life that you're addicted to. And, 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 and I think one of the, the critical um, things that, that need to be invented is, is how to get people unhooked. So, so that they can actually realize that there is something else and it has to change because this is just not going to continue. It's funny, as I, as I, as I, as I talk, I, I'm thinking that I'm, I'm mouthing words of 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. This is not sustainable. <laughs> and yet, no one's no one's invent, invented yet or come up with the the mass mechanism that's going to unhook us from all of the our, our from our addiction to the to the to the way it is i don't know jerry um so my feeling is that we're in one of those moments of punctuated equilibrium between the long periods where stuff happens a certain way and that a hundred years from now, people will look back on these decades that we're living through right this minute and say, well, damn, if, if somebody didn't invent the thing you just described during that period. And then, and so there's, to me, to oversimplify, there's like two futures, the road forks and either, um, damn, if they didn't fail entirely miserably as humans and destroy the planet and kill off most humans, or <clears throat> one of those sets of beliefs and attitudes and rituals and so forth and platforms that came in, grabbed hold, and ma humans managed to save themselves and managed to straighten things out. And, and, I, and I look around and I, I collect the candidate platforms and components and rituals and belief systems, right? Uh, that, that's what I, I, I'm avidly and actively looking for them. And I don't have the time and wherewithal to compare and contrast them and do a nifty analysis or to test them all out. I know a few people who run deep in several of them, that's really cool but haven't convened the conversation to say, hey, what's missing? Which ones work? How do they work together? Are they in opposition? Because I don't think there's like one platform or one belief system to rule them all. I think it's gonna be this lovely polyglot mess that happens to be pulling in the same sets of directions because its underlying principles are shared. And that means that they're not working against each other. They're working roughly together, <clears throat> right? So, so, um, I love that quest. And to me, when Wendy's like, uh, let's, call, let's find the emerging solution, that to me is a big part of the problem. And Wendy, I think your tapestry and my mosaic and whatever else, in some sense, are attempts to make sense of that possible positive future. And that's why we're excited about them, right? I'm not excited about curating the brain for, for uh, 24 years because uh, it shows how well we're doomed and how like, how much we're heading toward the apocalypse. Like I have that stuff in there, but I'm really excited about it because if we made better sense of the world together, we might actually solve for some of these things. Woohoo! I just put a, sorry, Stacey, go ahead. I keep thinking of all the uh, online conversations I've ever been in with people that are really committed to helping save the environment and how they've gone at each other and wound up into all these fighting matches. And um, I think the only, so the only way we get unhooked to something is to hook into something else. For me, that hook is human relation. Um, 
I'm somebody, I really like my luxuries. I don't know how I would deal without air conditioning. But when I was a kid, we used to go to the Catskills and there was no air conditioning and there was no luxuries. And I lived in a shack. And if I had the opportunity to be frozen in time in any period, it would be there because everywhere mm -hmm. around me were people that loved me, that I loved. Not that we didn't fight, <laughs> not that we didn't have different opinions, but that means more than anything. And so as I'm thinking about this whole, um, what we're doing, this whole project, you know, you mentioned somebody in jest earlier that should have been invited here. But in another situation, that's exactly who should have been invited here because these are, these are the connections that we need to make. And we can do that when we see each other in a different way. You know, it's, um, anyway, so I, I feel very emotional right now because that being human and connecting and being in this moment and re recognize, you know, we talk about recognizing we're connected to the earth. How can I recognize I'm, if I can't recognize that I'm connected to you, how can I recognize I'm connected to a tree? Mm -hmm. so, it's a big undertaking we have. It is. Really big. I just put a note in the chat, negotiating the non-negotiable by Daniel Shapiro. Um, he's the president of the Harvard International Negotiation Project. And he starts the book off by describing being at Davos. And he's in a room at Davos away from the media with, you know, like 50, um, 50 big movers and shakers in the world, presidents of corporations and presidents of universities and people in the government service and diplomatic corps. And um, they're told that, you know, they are they're all in small groups, they're told you have to save the world, right? Um, you have to come up with a way to save the world. And all of a sudden the lights go out and this door opens and then an alien comes in and says, you have one hour to figure out how you're gonna save the world or I will destroy it. And then disappears. And so people are charged with how we're gonna save the world. And it's incredibly rare that people actually come together to save the world. You know. For a long time, we've had this idea, if we just had an external foe, we could all come together and focus our attention on, we would pull humanity together. That's not how it works. That's not the way people go after it. And the very, very few times where running that exercise, um, yeah, like maybe a novel virus that would wipe people out, yeah, that's gonna work. Um, <laughs> so the very few times when, when the, the simulation has been successful, it's been where people have been able to put aside ego and really listen deeply and include other points of view that they don't necessarily agree with. And I think that's where we get hung up as, you know, um, we are disconnected from each other to the, to, in extreme ways. Um, one of the things capitalism has, has done is, and I don't mean to romanticize, you know, different times when people lived in small communities where everybody had to support each other because that all, all, all kinds of problems. But we live in an age now where you can say fuck you to somebody, I can live on my own and I don't have to be a nice person and I can, you know, just do whatever I want because we've set that up. But but that comes at an enormous cost, um, that, that relational social cost and the ecological cost. Um, how many people do you know that that make all their own clothing and grow all their own food and do everything. Nobody does it anymore. You know, we're all embedded in the system. So um, we all have varying degrees of, of ways that we are both tacitly and explicitly making that okay. And the inertia is really hard to overcome. You know, you wake up and go, I want to change. And it's like, wow, I want to change too. I'm going to get rid of my car. Well, I live in a place where I have to have a car. You know, if I get rid of my car, it takes me three hours to go somewhere in public transit that I could get to in 40 minutes in a car. I'm not willing to make that trade off. So there, there's things that are stacked against us. And, and I'm interested in where the tipping point comes where enough people say, this is not going to work. You know how much it costs to keep a horse in Marin County? They are expensive, yeah. <laughs> because a you lot know? of them, you could just borrow someone else's, just like slide over to some stable and... Yeah, I'd have to be, well, there are some horses in, in the San Rafael area, but I'd have to go more towards West Marin for that. Um, Good point. And then, you know, the hang horse thieves, I think, still. So, you know, <laughs> I can be careful about the borrowing part. Um, so I, I'm really interested in identifying the, the, the places where, and I think the experience of the week is one, waking people up in a way to, to recognize we are facing some really big, 
big problems and we're facing them um, disjointedly and, and without a sense of community and without a sense of how to go about handling them. And just the first step of getting people to recognize that I think is really important. I'm very, I have not watched the other two episodes yet. I'm really interested to see what's gonna happen, what they've got for ideas on how to make this happen. Um, and I, I will say, I've always had trouble with theory U because I think it's the wrong visual metaphor. It's like Sisyphus. You push the rock up and you fall back down on the U, right? It's like, I need, I need a sine wave. I, I, I need the complete circle, even if it's opened up into a sine wave. So that's just my own thing of, you know, they didn't put at the bottom of the U there, the utter desolation and despair of, I am overwhelmed, I surrender. That's the part of the initiation experience where you get dismembered and you, everything you ever held dear is stripped away from you. And then you slowly reassemble into a new being. And when you reemerge, you need a new name. You need people to recognize you've been through some kind of change. We forget that in this culture. We don't have a sense of initiation that when people have gone through a very deep initiatory process, they are different and you can't treat them the way you used to treat them in the days of old. So I have been down into that bottom part many times of, I give up, I know I just, this is, I can't handle it. And I've been dismembered and I've been reassembled a few times and it keeps going on. And um, yeah, Heroes Journey meets Through You. It's, it's, it's better explained as a circle, the ambit, you know. Um, anyway, that's just my own personal little dig at, at them, at Through You. So, so feel of samsara. <laughs> So why, why will this time be different than Al Gore's warning of 30, 35 years ago? Why will it be any different? Why will it, why will it, why will it fall on? I, on, on I actually, yeah. Yeah, to, to answer that, I actually think there are more people who are mm -hmm. awake to the threat and to the potential for change um, than even a decade ago. When I first, first started, I, like, I was part of an environmental club as a parent teachers association at my daughter's um, elementary school. And I picked that partly because it's a topic that interested me and I know we could give back a little with the little amount of time that I had, but also because no one was paying attention. We could do whatever we wanted. And then Inconvenient Truth came out. And within a month, it went from, yeah, those are kind of like the tree hugging moms over there to, so what are you guys doing to solve the climate problem? <laughs> It was just, it was very interesting. And that to me, from my, in my trajectory through this was, a, was one of the big changes that I saw um, of people waking up. And I think that has continued, you know, in different ways for different people over different things. Um, I think it's been um, subverted a couple of times and distracted a couple of times with different politics or theories or whatever. But I generally think that the, the, um, the impetus, the urgency has been growing for a lot of people. And I think a lot of people are in that space of don't know what to do. Um, Ken, when you were saying before that you feel like psychology doesn't have a lot to offer um, in the space of like trying to figure out how to, what to do with all of this. What's interesting for me in my background in that, in that sphere and also my spiritual practice is to me, the science, particularly coming out of the positive psychology angle and spirituality has both looked at kind of what's emerging, what calls people forward to things. And that was something I was posting in the chat before versus why do, I mean, there's plenty of motivation. We will understand a lot when people are upset about something, right? Or they have a illness or they have fear or they have, right? And that's politics types right into that and gives us those narratives that we think are so destructive. But we, what we don't have really yet, but is, a, but is getting stronger with every month that passes is how do we develop a narrative around something that's calling us forward into something better that, will motive, that we can all galvanize around. And I do think there's good science there. And I do think even, and, and where science is meeting spirituality, I do think there's a richness there as the two worlds are coming together that, um, that provides us an opportunity to mine a little bit for, for how we can call people for it. And that brings me back to, there are plenty of people who are already scared and motivated. And then I think there's a larger group of people who would do something if they felt called forward to something that they don't need to go through that dismembering, right? The, the hero's journey version, they just need to get on, like jump this track to that track. 
and they would if they saw that there was a benefit to do so. So I think there's a couple different tactics that you know we can be taking, and and there's a lot that we could be doing. Um, two things, and by way of answering Stuart's question, one is, and the first was a very short story of my completely amateur take on postmodernism. And uh, <clears throat> again, I'm going to share screen. Uh, so my one of my beliefs is that postmodernists were actually right. They were just way too early and they wound up talking only to themselves. They wound up creating a code that made it so that, so that you, you couldn't understand these people. They, they were speaking in, in, in these abstract terms. But, but if you go back and you look at what Derrida and Deleuze and Guattari and all these people were saying, it's like, well, shit, we are totally living in the, in the, the, the society, the spectacle. And, 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 and even like the rhizomes and the idea of, you know, the World Wide Web is the rhizomal network of, of human knowledge. All this kind of stuff was there. And then I just connected that to a really important thought in my brain that I did in 2020. Does 2020 mark a generational tipping point? <clears throat> and here I'm saying Greta Thunberg. So uh, here's Greta, got a lot of stuff on Greta. Uh, but everything sort of that feels a little Greta-ish. So um, uh, zero hour of school strikes for climate change was just Greta. Psych, uh, the rising popularity of a wealth tax. Uh, 2006 might be peak democracy is a different sort of focus for me, but the Sunrise Movement, Nerd Friteria, uh, Gen Z coming up, all of us, AOC and the squad, uh, brand new Congress, I forget even what that is, Pete Buttigieg, a bunch of really sort of young people showing up, uh, Jacinda Ardern being the prime minister of New Zealand and being spectacular and running a country really beautifully, the Green New Deal, things like that. So I have this feeling that if these groups, uh, I have also here the, the, the school students against us, uh, here we go, Mar 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 Marjorie Stoneham Douglas school <coughs> students activated by the shootings. <coughs> But if, if these groups can loosely link arms and elect and through one avenue elect in a whole new slate of people to run things and then separately actually get busy on the big questions, I think they could actually make a difference. And they wouldn't be too early like the postmodernists are, were. They would be like, oh, okay, this is crucial. We actually need to pull this off and get it done. And, and, I'm, and I'm also sort of trying to, I'm taking the lid off a little bit of another really important conversation that we haven't touched very much and that the, the week hasn't touched on at all, which is, hey, guess what? Solutions to all these thorny problems are complicated, counteractive, uh, like th there's a tremendous amount of debate about what to do to solve these problems. Tremendous and, and very reasonable debate. And I'm, I'm on a scientific emailing list where, you know, Amory Lovins is basically like nuke, no nukes anywhere whatsoever. And other people are like, why is Germany closing down safe functional nukes that are good energy and then buying coal on the side and getting itself indebted to Russia for a pipeline? Like seriously people. Um, and, and, and so all these things are very, very hard to, to sort out. And if we don't get our heads together and sort them out together, that's going to be a mess. But it's also exciting and fun and a huge business opportunity. I was, I was sitting in front of uh, Al Gore speaking uh, some years ago, and his first sentence was, I, I, I just can't figure out why, biz, why I can't convince business people that green is a huge business opportunity. I, I, just, I just don't understand why that doesn't engage, why somebody's got to build the smokestack scrubber gear that goes on the factory to clean the air. <laughs> somebody's got to, like, really, seriously now, and if you think about who's yeah. been defended, like, let's see. So we're going to put yeah, more right. money in the shareholders of Exxon and, and Texaco. And like, so here's a great defending? example. Like my husband worked for Consumer Reports, right, years ago. And he worked there for about 10 years. And I said, please, oh, my God, have them add a green rating. Right. Make it up. Like, I don't even care what criteria you use. You have right. experts in the building who will add a green rating. All I want as a consumer is to look at a green rating as the number one reason to buy something. Your consumer reports, <laughs> please put a green, couldn't do it. So, Internal so politics around a green rating. It, they, and that was now 17 years ago or something. I, also I tried to talk them out of using the word consumer. Yeah. 
so so I want to throw another vector in that's that's popping around. Um, and I agree with everything you say, Jerry. Um, and the other vector is um, is is Vladimir Putin, because he's just a metaphor, an example of another phenomenon that's present here. And it will be, would be interesting to see how core liberal democracies deal with Putin if if he were to invade Ukraine. Um, um, but that's that's a that's a a powerful force that's present on a, on a, on a planetary basis that, that needs to be addressed in some way. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what, mm -hmm. but I, all I can think of during this period of time with, you know, with him massing a, a million troops on, on, the, on the border or whatever the number was, um, what the fuck are you doing? We're in the middle of a pandemic and in the middle of climate change and you're, you're, you're operating as if it was 1855. I mean, this is just nuts. It's just absolutely crazy. This goes to something that um, is not part of the week, but I just recently read Ministry for the Future and um, there's some black ops that go on that say, you know, there's really about a hundred people in the world who are responsible for funding all these disinformation campaigns and you know we're going to take them out and we're going to make sure that they do it. and and you know that's it's it's not hugely featured but it shows up in the book and you know i much prefer having spent all these years studying buddhism to you know go the enlightenment route but i recognize you know in reading the dalai lama's autobiography he talks about Cho and lai who they referred to as chu and lai and there's nothing that the, the, you know, the Tibetans were the most spiritually of all people on the planet and the Chinese came in and wiped them out. Like, you know, done, you're, you're gone. We're taking over your country, fuck you. We don't care how great you are. Um, when you're confronted with that, when you have that um, people who say, this is, we've got power, we're gonna use it ruthlessly. We don't care what the costs are. What's the appropriate response? If you're Jewish and you're told by the Nazis you don't have the right to exist, what's the appropriate response, right? Um, you fight like hell. You know, like you come at me. You know, I'm I'm a peaceful person. You come at me, I will take you out if I need to. And we don't have that. Living in a nobody in charge world, we allow that kind of delegitimization of certain populations to fall wherever the money and power is and say, that's okay, you know, we'll deal with it. That's what Putin has. Putin has money and power to say, we don't recognize your right to exist. We're going to do what we want. And there's no collective response on the part of the planet. Actually, I should say there is. I mean, Biden's doing a very good job with diplomacy and economic sanctions, but there isn't yet an overwhelmingly, you can't do that coming from the people because the people aren't organized as the people. They're, they're divided as you know, the, the serfs and the peons. Thanks for articulating overwhelming response, Ken, because that's what it demands in some way. You wish that there would be a do not do this because, you know, it's, it's kind of like a Disney movie where all the animals come running at the last minute to save everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how to get there, how to, you know, that, how do we, and, and I, I don't like to use the how questions. So let me ask this, what would it look like stepping into an imaginal space? What would it look like if the world could organize itself to ensure its own future, to make sure, you know, uh, Todd mentioned, that, you know, big brain humans. I have this thing, the dinosaurs, live for 165 million years with brains the size of walnuts. We have these massive brains. We're taking ourselves out of the picture after 3 million years. Can we at least have as long as dinosaurs had? I would just, that's my vision. I want to, I want the human race to live at least as long as the dinosaurs to allow these big brains to actually network and create a, a world where we could flourish. We could thrive that all of the, um, the, the problems that plague us, that are solvable could be solved. They will never solve, you know, there's always gonna be dissent. The Greeks had it right. Families are really tough. Mothers will kill sons, sons will kill fathers and sleep with mothers and, you know, siblings kill siblings and all that stuff. That's never gonna go away, but we don't have to have it enacted on a massive global scale. Um, almost all of the technical issues that we're facing, the 
this stuff is known. It's the adaptive challenge of changing the mindsets. You know, when I talk about stuff like this, I'm labeled a utopian and naive. I don't think I'm a utopian. I don't think I'm naive. This is doable shit. What's you, what's you, what's naive is to believe that people can't come together in their own collective self-interest and, and move um, effectively. There's a story that I, I've heard from the Iroquois that said, you know, um, the Iroquois had slaves. It took them a thousand years to get rid of slavery. They recognized it as an affront to the human soul. And when Washington and Jefferson and Franklin were putting together, you know, the nascent government of, of what would become the United States of America, they were warned, you can't allow slavery. Slavery will tear you apart from the inside. It will just destroy you. It's, it is, you know, um, it, it's not acceptable. And they were told, well, we, we can't get them to vote on this if we take, if we Put slave takes slavery off the table. No one will vote for the government. It will fail. So we, we're going to go for it. And then, eighty years later, there's the civil war, torn apart from the inside. We're still fighting that battle today. We allow some people to say, "I'm better than you. I'm gonna I'm gonna rule over you. You are subservient to me." That can't be an organizing principle for human activity on the planet. It does not work. It's been proven not to work, and yet it remains as part of our consciousness, as part of our our struggle. And how do we get past that? And you know, the thing is the Gnostic move, um, getting up above and saying, oh, we're all one. Can't we see we're all one? That's the Gnostic move. It works great if you're looking at things from above, but when you're down the ground, no, it looks different. You know, you're over there and I'm over here. We're in different bodies. We're not one. Tell me how you're one with Hitler. Tell me how you're one with Pol Pot. Tell me how you're one with, with Stalin. Then we can talk about being all one. So the all one thing doesn't, it's, it's a spiritual bypass that does not work what works on the ground to bring people together, even when they don't like each other. And the only thing I know of comes out of Macharana is saying that love, which is legitimizing the other, no matter how they arise in your experience, legitimizing their right to exist is the only emotion that expands intelligence in a social system. So we have to love each other. This means we have to like each other. We have to at least acknowledge that you all have the right to exist. And then if we say that, now how do we negotiate? And there may be some people who are going to be like, okay, that tribe on the Indian islands where we just let them, um, let them be that, that stupid couple of years ago, um, evangelical who paddled out there in a canoe and was immediately killed. Like those people, they need to be left alone. That's, that's how they get along. And we don't, you know, we're not going to mess with that, but they're not a threat to us. We maintain some kind of, of force to deal with threats. And then we work on getting along. I just pasted the Maturana quote about love in the chat, which Thank I you. may have gotten from your mention. Do you want to read it to us? There is something peculiar about human beings. We are loving animals. I know we will kill each other and do all those horrible things. I have to scroll in on this. My eyes are not so good. Um, but if you look at any story of corporate transformation where everything begins to go well, innovations appear, people are happy to be there, you will see that it's a story of love. Most problems in companies are not solved through competition, nor through fighting, not through authority. They're solved through the only emotion that expands intelligent behavior. They're solved through the only emotion that expands creativity. As, this, as in this emotion, there is freedom for creativity. The, this emotion is love. Love expands intelligence. Love enables creativity. Love returns autonomy. And as it returns autonomy, it returns responsibility and the experience of freedom. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. Lovely quote. Beautiful. Yeah. I used to love Maturana's statement that um, that compassion and love are in human biology. You know, because of oppositional thumb joints, we have the capacity to caress. And um, there's not that many animals, other other creatures that have that capacity to caress. To, to, to caress. They have hoofs and paws and nails and, you know, claws and stuff like that. I, I always thought that was an interesting um, metaphor. Primates. Mm -hmm. And that's part of Tamsin's book on teaming that humans are 98% chimp. And so that's where all the Machiavellian, you know, the politics and hierarchy comes in. But we're also a 2% hive. Um, you know, we can act like ants or termites uh, or bees. And when those two things get coupled together, you get a super organism capable of organizing on behalf of the whole at every level where everyone knows what I'm doing right now is serving the larger good. And as soon as that gets lost, I think that's when we get into trouble. Um, 
I think something that Wendy said prompted this for me and a, a hope of what's coming in the next two episodes. Um, I feel like one thing that we all need is to reframe what working on climate change is. That there's, there's things that we should do less of and we should do more of. You know, it's known that leading, re, eating less meat has a positive impact. Um, flying less has a positive impact, but those are all like trackable, measurable, I do it or I don't do it. And to me, if, if we look at this through the lens of our awareness, our creativity, our awakeness, all different ways of saying the same thing, we need more of this love. And so if you have children and you're loving your children, well, you're doing climate work. If you're a manager at work and you're taking care of your people, you're doing climate work, especially if you're fighting uh, inequities because uh, so many people are in a state of deprivation and fear and long-term trauma that they cannot possibly contribute very much because they're in a survival mode. So anyone who's doing work of balancing out inequities, you are doing climate work. All of this contributes. And it's, it, it's like the, we need direct action, but we need so much more than that. So I hope there's a reframe. Mm. I have a meme somewhere in my library <clears throat> of a small child pushing against the belly of a sumo. And the small child is labeled individual action on climate change. And the sumo is labeled the 100 companies most responsible for pollution and climate change, right? So I love individual action because it makes me feel that I have some agency, but man, I'm also aware that the deck is stacked against us. It requires such a huge amount of coordination to, um, to get those people together to actually make a change with, with that. And it's, there are, as Jerry pointed out at the beginning, there are vested interests. I mean, Exxon knew in the 60s, their internal research showed if we keep burning fossil fuels, we're going to destabilize the climate. And what did they do? They buried that, right? Oh, well, we, that would mean we won't make our billions of dollars. Huh. If billions of dollars versus death of the planet. Hey, put the goons in my pocket. I don't care about the planet, right? So that's a, where's the, the leverage point to stand on that? Um, and, and move the earth, you know? Stacy, how you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm just thinking like, <laughs> I mean, I'm in my child's mind and I'm thinking that well, number one, how do we, okay. How do we give an opportunity to people who are doing wrong, an opportunity to do something right? That's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, and then I'm thinking about farming and I'm thinking about food and I'm thinking about, you know, the different things that we think about, like in terms of like industrialized farming and in time, in as far as putting like limits on things, I don't think limits for big companies should be equivalent to limits for smaller people. Like I, uh, you know, and I don't understand why we always have like one, one fix or the other, because it's not fair. And um, I was thinking, you know, if it were so not, I can't think of the word, it's so uncomfortable to have big industrialized farms. If it was so expensive to be so big, what would, what, what changes would happen? And as far as, you know, a lot of people, they may not think in terms, or maybe in the past, a lot of people didn't think about like their health when they ate McDonald's. But now with the pandemic, and especially people who are anti-vaxxers, they do care about the immune system. And if we could join together on something like that, healthier food in a way that frame things differently for different people is basically what I'm trying to say. And we don't do that. Instead, we just flip off. Oh, they think like that. I can't deal with them. 
So it, it's a little frustra frustrating because to me, it's about the journey. And it's not about, you know, we get there and then we can do it. No, if we can't do it in our little circles, we're not going to be do, able to do it as things scale. So like in my, when I think of my community, I'm not going to get along with everybody in my community, but I could definitely see relying more on the community gardens here or working on the local food system here as a starting point, because I mean, I, I don't know what to say. It's just so many pieces and to keep trying to make it like we could follow one straight line. It doesn't work like that. You know, it's, that's where I am. Thanks for asking. I love, I love that idea of um, giving people a chance to have done wrong to switch. And the first thing that came to mind was uh, any company that's done serious harm to the environment. What if we offered them uh, if you change your practices now, we will protect you from all future law, all lawsuits from this point forward. I mean, that what an opportunity that would be, because you know, a lot of these companies, just like tobacco did, a lot of these companies are just, they're, they're going to confront this at some point, and it's probably not too far in the future. It's a great idea. Uh as was pointed out by the fact that insurance companies are, are recognizing we can't insure for fire anymore. By the way, I found I was studying climate uh, sea level rise here in the Bay Area, and I, I learned that all flood insurance is underwritten by FEMA. And do you know what FEMA's cap on flood insurance is? $250,000. So if you own a house on Belvedere Island, your garage one part of your garage is $250,000 for your house goes, you're not going to get shit for your insurance, right? So um, as we recognize we can't insure for floods anymore, we can't insure for fire, uh, acts of God are going to come under climate change is going to be classified as a lot of acts of God, right? Oh, it may be man-made, but it's actually nature. So we don't want to insure for that. That's a huge leverage point right there of, of, how can of, of how we can start to use businesses and markets to shift things. And I really like the idea that you just floated, Todd. It's sort of like a truth and reconciliation of we all, we're not, you're not fooling anybody. We know this is going on, but if you cop to it now and you stand up and start to change your practices, you'll be spared. But if you don't, you're going to really pay for the, for it. Unmute, Jerry. Uh, thank you. Um, two things. Uh, one is I've had a thought for quite a while. What if we use truth and reconciliation for relations between communities and companies uh, or to address racism? And uh, there was also a thought later about that. But, but I think a lot of companies, a lot of organizations have skeletons in the closet mm -hmm. and they can't be honest. Like if they were honest and, and worse, we are in the vigilante era where the answer to malfeasance is off with their heads and salt the earth where they used to stand. It's not, hey, you did bad. Let's figure out how to mainstream you back into society. So as long as we have vigilante justice and savage justice uh, without sort of actually deepening and opening and, and sitting with things, that, that's going to be really hard. And TRCs, which are not perfect, <clears throat> are actually really interesting that way. And then the second thing I wanted to add was an open question I have about reinsurance. And I have, a, I have a, an amateur answer to it. My question is, why the hell aren't the major, like Swiss Re, uh, Munich Re, et cetera, there's some huge reinsurance corporations that are, that are like big, big companies. Why are they not completely up our noses about climate change? Aren't they supposed to be the long-term insurers? Like, don't they see that they're, they're like, everything is just falling apart? The answer, I believe, is that their contracts are renegotiated annually and their premiums and profits go up as the insurance risks go up, mm. I think. I could be wrong about this. I'd love to be fact-checked on it. That but would be a, a great there's a, intervention. There is a complete, there's a complete conflicting uh, uh, you know, uh, objectives or whatever it's called, uh, problem in that industry. Yeah. What, I mean, it's the same in the healthcare industry. It makes more money when people are sick. Right. Right, so- Sorry, Stuart, yeah. go ahead. 
No, no, I, I was going to say a few years ago when um, when the New York City subway uh, flooded, um, I forget what storm it was. Sandy. Yeah, but they they brought in a bunch of consultants um, from the Netherlands, um, <laughs> and and the consultant said, um, "You're never going to figure out how to do this. You're just acting stupid. Just stop <laughs> build, Just stop. Just stop building in flood zones. <laughs> it's a very simple solution. Just stop building in flood zones." <laughs> Period. End of story. And that's just, it's just, it's just going to get worse. Um, but nope. what I'm, what I'm hearing a little bit of is that, um, and, I, and I love that the, that truth and reconciliation came up because we need to make massive changes and we need to have truth and reconciliation surrounding all of those massive changes, whatever kind of edicts that they were you know, and, and, and maybe some large percentage of the population will actually say, okay, we need to change. Okay. We need to change. But, but the, 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 the huge programs that this will all require, it's just, they're almost unfathomable in some, some sense. And yet it, it's the only way out. Otherwise we're going to just have um, chaos and dystopia. And just one last thought, Stacy, I'm with you. I want to go to the Catskills. Let's all let's all let's all just go to the go to, go to the Catskills. I keep looking for bungalow colonies for sale. <laughs> so we have about five. And I minutes. saw that it was outside the flood zones and outside the. <laughs> right. I took note. Right. A lot of them were turned into spiritual centers, you know, in in, oh. in the Catskills. Yeah. Um. We have about five minutes left before we wrap our call. I would just want to thank you for a really rich conversation, which I knew was going to happen given the, the people on the call. Um, any thoughts, any closing thoughts as we're wrapping up? Um, you can like, what would you like to see uh, in the next couple episodes from the week? And they will be asking us for feedback. So if you've got specific things, just jot them down. And then um, when we're all done, we can, we can send a joint um, letter to Fred and, and Helene and say, you know, we really appreciate this. I think this could be tweaked. You know, I'd like to see this, blah, blah, blah. So, I, you know, everybody on this call has thought about this subject um, in depth. It's, it's been in, in consciousness. And what I would love to see, um, and I, I don't really have hope for it, but I'm willing to be surprised is some, some real global path, a, a real global path, not a, not a Pollyanna global path, but a real global path addressing, you know, the vectors that, that, that we've talked about today. That's my hope. I'm connected. Thank you, Stuart. I'm connected to, uh experiment in the state of California to pay citizens to join healing circles, community healing circles. And if we have to pay people to have an experience that might shake them up, open them up in some way, if that's the, what we have to do these days, that I'm open to that. Great. Great! What a what a what a wonderful vehicle for wealth transfer. Mm -hmm. um, is everyone okay with my posting this recording as I usually do to YouTube openly and like that? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Then we can. Sure. Then we can refer to it, point other people to it, whatever. I just put the link to my brain notes there. I've just I've been curating during. Great. So whatever things I mentioned are connected, and lots of things you mentioned are quoted or connected. Okay. Um, and Jerry, would you send it to um, Mila so she has a chance to catch up if she wants to? Because she did email and say she's in the country and didn't have any Wi-Fi. So yep. she'll be with us tomorrow. Um, I'm actually debriefing with Matt my experience finally uh, two months later after we completed with the uh, with the financial services project. So uh, that's at 930. We're scheduled to run 45 minutes. But if we wrap um, in half an hour, I will be on the call on time. Otherwise, I might be 10, 15 minutes late, but I will be here. Um, so, uh, yeah.
Yeah, you were you were saying feedback and thoughts about the next couple of videos. Um, no. Feedback. I, I really appreciated what you were saying earlier about the U shape. I think it was Todd that brought it up, right? I can't remember, and maybe Ken. Can be. And, uh, yeah. So, um, I, you know, I would love to see it maybe shift into a spiral, <laughs> right, or something Ooh. like that, um, so that it so that it acknowledges the fact that we will revisit these same phases over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and that it's an evolution of, uh, you know, of understanding and appreciation and application and stuff. So, so this morning I followed a link that went to Twitter where there was a video of a piece of art that looks like a bird, a fluffy bird from this perspective. And then it's one of those pieces of art that when you look at it this way, it turns out to be made <clears throat> of found objects from the trash and toys and whatever of the right color in the right place. So that when you see them this way, it looks, it looks like an Oriole. Right, and it, it was it's beautiful and so forth. And I spent a little bit of time trying to figure out what do you call that kind of art where it shifts, where it's like, hey, it looks like Albert Einstein, but no, it's a bicycle seat and a whatever. <laughs> um, it strikes me that a series of a series of reinforcing waves that build and that echo might look like a U seen from end on, and that if you took theory U and stretched it sideways it might turn into a resonant set of waves that are being pumped and moved for larger scale social change. And that theory you might not be a one shot deal, but might be a repetitive cycle we need to do with more people, with more questions, with all those kinds of things. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. This is actually from uh, Sustainable Sonoma. I think um, everybody who knows him, Jeff, um, what's Jeff's last name? Jeff Aiken was part of this. So this is the transformation cycle, which it, it can be seen as either a circle or a spiral where, you know, we start up around 11 o'clock, we have order, everything is great. And then at midnight chaos strikes, right? And then we go into grief, anger, denial, sadness, despair, letting go, additional feelings. And then there's that void. You have to sit with the emptiness, sit with the, the void for the breakthrough, move into wonder, imagination, vision, empowerment, action. And if you look at this most consultants love to work from 6 a.m. to midnight. They hate to work from midnight to 6 a.m., right? <laughs> because uh, nobody wants to be in the grief and the anger to die on the sadness. And yet, the dark, this is often referred to as darkness. Darkness is incredibly fruitful. Uh, Joan Halifax has a book called The Fruitful Darkness, you know? And um, we need to be granting legitimacy and exploring the dark side. Um, don't be afraid of the dark. The dark has light within it. Um, there's tremendous creativity and generativity in there. So um, I just thought I would, would share that. You could yeah, I, I, yeah, Ken, I mean, that's great. I, I couldn't agree more that, you know, everything, when we resist going round the wheel, right? Like the medicine wheel <laughs> is this, the hero's journey is this, the you know, there's a, there's a lot of cyclical, the cycles of nature are this, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think um, no matter how people come find their way to understanding a cyclical nature of, of, of decomposition and emergence um, or the creative process or, you know, whatever, I think all these things kind of follow the same trajectories. Um, then, you know, people, I think, wake up to these same things that we were talking about needing to wake up to how we're all connected, how it keeps going in cycles, how it's more about the journey, right? <laughs> all the lessons that are, yeah. that are gained from, from that kind of thing. Um, so I think that they're, if, as feedback, them making some semblance of a reference to that, it doesn't have, in my mind, it doesn't have to be one particular system or, or, or approach but just the fact that it's a cyclical nature uh, along the lines of the way they beautifully um, emphasized how emotional this is, right? And that we're gonna go there um, is, you know, along those same vein, that would be my, my feedback. And um, I'm hoping, I think I already said it at the beginning, but I'm kind of hoping <laughs> that the next two uh, start shifting us into some solutions. And, and I'm getting, and I'm getting that old rock and roll song, The Darkest Hour is before, just before dawn. Each night before you go to bed, my baby, blah, 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 blah. Anyway. Nice. Mm -hmm.
Good to see you all. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Remember, you can play these things at faster than normal time, and it makes it go quicker. <laughs> Thank you. I actually do 1.75 with subtitles, and I get... Wow! <laughs> because the subtitles make sure I don't if I, I don't miss stuff. So that's it's, astonishing. Yeah. I'm gonna try, I'm gonna give that a whirl. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Right. Everybody. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Jerry. Thanks for recording. Mm -hmm. Thank you.